Okay, I'm making a video here about AGM batteries and how to recondition them because generally speaking, reconditioning AGM batteries is not even considered possible or uh, the, the success rate is very low. So let me tell you the story of what's going on back here. This is the Prius nickel metal hydride battery that um, I reconditioned one, took it all apart, and I decided eventually that the cells were uh, even though I was reconditioning them and I was getting all the statistics out of them and I was improving them, I decided that the cells were just too old. They weren't responding as the way I would like them to. And it was also basically a pain in the ass. It was taking me, um, mm, I would say, a day or two per cell, sometimes even three. And there are 28 cells in the battery. So I ended up swapping out and getting another one. But the other thing that happened was because I was taking so long to recondition the nickel metal hydride, main main this is called the traction battery right here. The battery that is the AGM 12 volt starting battery, which controls all the ancillary electronics, not the main traction drive, but your lights and your key fob and things like that. These are fairly expensive. I mean, you can pay 220, 230 bucks for that little battery easily. And that's an Optima AGM battery. Now, Optima's got a fairly good name. My experience with Optima, I am not a big fan. I'm not a big fan at all. Um, I would almost go. I, I would almost go so far as to say I'm generally not a big fan of AGM batteries. But I mean, Optima, Optima is is definitely a respectable battery brand. It's not one of these that tries to cheat you. But here's what happened. My car was down for I would say 21 days, 30 days, on, and I would occasionally uh, occasionally uh, hit this with a little bit of. Uh, uh, trickle current just to keep it just to keep it going. I really, I mean, 30 days should not be that big of a deal for an AGM battery. This battery is less than a year old to survive. Well, that was absolutely not the case. When I finally got this one, when I finally got the traction battery installed, the AGM the AGM starter battery was dead as a doornail. It was somewhere. I think when I first tested, it was like two to three volts. And I go much deeper than volts, but I know that if I start with volts, it's indicative of everything else. Meaning I'll, 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 I'll investigate the amp hour rating and I have the tools to do all of that. It was dead as a doornail. I said, well, you know what? I'm not going to give up so easily. So I started to put it through a couple of the processes that I've got and that are discussed in that, um, that link. Uh, I put, started to put it through a couple of the processes and it, uh, it came back a little bit. Um, I think I got it up as high as, let's say I went from two or three to around five, five something. None of these are even close to being resolved in terms of making it a good battery. And then, um, I went through another process and I brought it up to around, um, uh, seven or eight. Uh, I think I eventually got it to 10 and it just wouldn't go anywhere, anywhere, uh, beyond that. And then it, then it collapsed back down. So I thought, well, that's obviously a dead battery. Um, and I was looking around locally for uh, another one, and I couldn't couldn't get it. And and I really, if it had been a standard battery like this, uh, flooded lead acid, I would have absolutely brought the battery back 100%. I was giving up a little easier than I normally would, and I wasn't using all the tools because it's AGM. So the AGM battery has different. Uh, it's not so much different chemistry as it is a different format for more or less the same chemistry. Um, and they do have a slightly different chemistry, but especially in Optima, they wrap their cores and do all kinds of things. They don't have rectangular plates. And you know the, the, the theory of sulfation uh, doesn't apply quite as much as with, as with uh, flooded lead acid batteries because um, everything's in a gel format. So anyway, long and short of it is, I ended up buying that battery as opposed to an Optima because I was kind of disappointed. Oh, I was very disappointed that the Optima uh, crapped out early. Well. In the meantime, because I had the traction battery and it was working fine, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to connect up. And, and of course, this is 100% not recommended. This is redneck mechanic work or engineering at its finest, but it worked. I said, while this one's arriving, because locally this one was like 230 plus tax or something. I said, you know what, that's ridiculous. It's, nowhere near. it's a very small battery. It's a 12 volt, 33 amp hour battery. I mean, that's a joke to spend that much money on that battery. It's just because of the format and it's got some venting requirements and things like that. So anyway, online, I was able to eventually find this one, $110 off of Amazon. I don't like buying from Amazon if I can help it, but they're the only ones who had it. So I ordered that one in um, and it's a, a AC Delco battery. Uh, AC Delco batteries 
Or okay, I'm not sure who they're make, having made by. It could be uh, Johnson, uh, could be Interstate, could be Johnson Controls Interstate. Um, I saw an Exide truck the other day, so Exide looks like they're still hanging around even though they went through bankruptcy. But in any case, so I connected this flood, flooded lead acid battery uh, through these um, through these you know uh, jumper cables essentially, and these are these aren't really actually jumper cables. These are cables. Just so you know, I was officially in the battery business. These are cables I used for the battery business all the time. I mean, I would. They're very short. They're not designed to be jumper cables, but they were for me to go terminal to terminal on, you know, when I would be connect, connecting a series of batteries. So connected this to that, bammo, everything lights up, works fine. And I and I and I drive around uh, a couple of weeks, two three weeks with this redneck gorilla mechanical setup. And then I get this in the other day, and I said, well, I'm going to go ahead and replace that battery with this new one and get back to uh, a more civilized state of affairs because I can't stand having, having my car completely in pieces like this. And I thought, I said to myself, you know, I'll bet you 10 to 1 for some reason that when I go to replace this battery and swap it out, because it was dead. The only reason I kept it in there was because um, I wanted all the terminals and the connections in place for connecting up this battery. That's it. I, it was basically a dead weight just holding up those uh, those components. But I said, you know, I'll bet you that the cycling that's going to happen between the good battery and the bad battery over a few weeks is going to bring back that cell. Because again, this was a one-year-old cell. Now, when you kill a battery as badly as that one was killed, because I think what happens with Prius is there's a, I, I wouldn't even call it a leakage current. I would call it a, uh, um, like a like a weight state current for all the components, uh, including the key fob and everything else. It's drawing some amps. I mean, it may be drawing um, a very, very low amp load, but you multiply it times three weeks or four weeks or more, and it'll kill any battery. And I mean, kill it. Like... Even though the battery's dead, it's still trying to draw from it, and that that sinks in the reverse chemistry, so that the battery, in theory, should never come back. In theory, of course, I I learned long ago that the theory is um, not at all reliable in a, in a number of different areas. But in any case, so I I grab my uh, handy uh, voltmeter, and um, I mean this thing was. At 5.8, I, I would never bought that battery if that thing was good. But I, you know what? I just put the voltmeter away. Let me grab it here. Okay. So here we go. If I can show you. So I've been running this battery, attached to that battery, for several weeks. And what's been happening is they've been cycling, essentially, the current. Um back and forth from each other this was the low low like it probably when i connected it was probably in the neighborhood of five point something volts so it was essentially a useless battery it wouldn't do anything that one was pretty red hot 13.1 when i finally connected it let's see if i can do this all right so that goes there that goes there what do you see there 12.7 volts i just had this inkling it would be this case it'd be the case 12.7, it's actually 12.8 if, if the negative was uh, tied in a little tighter, but 12.7 is still plenty good. And I just started the car. So that battery is back. And it came back by cycling with a, with a, with a correct voltage battery. So the entire circuit would be <clears throat> this battery provided the starting current through the terminals, through the terminals here. This is getting a piece of that starting current when we start up, when, when, when this is connected at all times, okay? Um, so, but the circuit from, from these terminals into the rest of the car is a, a slight negative, so it's drawing down, but not much. So slight negative when the car is not started. When the car started, these are probably cooking at around, you know, 14.4 is a typical, alternator current but the prius is an extremely sophisticated system they could be at 13.8 and i'm certain that they're constantly monitoring adjusting the the current but um the, the long and short of it is that what we've got is a high voltage battery and a low voltage battery and over time a couple of weeks 
Now, it may have happened earlier, so I don't know when it actually hit. I just was changing out the batteries today, or I, it turns out I'm not going to change out the battery today because there's no reason. That battery's perfectly good. Now I've got to figure out what to do with this battery. If anybody needs that battery, let me know. I can make a deal. But the point of it is that over time, with this low-voltage battery or uh, under-voltage battery and the standard-voltage battery and the hot supply coming from right here, these two were balancing out. These two were balancing out. Now, a curious thing would be to say, what's the voltage here on this battery? Oh, I shut off the voltmeter. So, uh, I don't even know if I can do this. Hold on. Well, I could see it was like 12.89. I could tell you basically that these two balanced out to the, I mean, to the hundredth decimal place. This one came in at 12.89 when I first measured that one. That was like 12.8788. So it was right there. Um, now I, I, there's no guarantee that that thing's 100% back. I'm gonna I'm gonna drive around with all these batteries in my back in my back uh, area here for a little while. But this is really big deal. Because it means that if you're willing to run a balancing cycle between a high cell and a low cell and uh, feed in continuous current over a couple of weeks, and of course it's only working while the car is driving, so it's, uh, I would imagine this could be done, this could be cycled, gosh, how, how many hours? And I mean, there are some trips that I took that were fairly long, so you know, let's call it uh, in the span of, uh, of a month or so, three weeks, a month. Let's call it somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 hours, 70 hours, which sounds like a lot of time, but I mean, it's, it's common to charge batteries for 24 hours. And if you're, if you're in the reconditioning business, you're going to, you're going to be cycling batteries, potentially some batteries for three, four, five days. So you could be a uh, hundred hour, 125 hour. Now I, I, I got my systems down where I could do it in eight hours. And, and the reason that was, was I was, um, I was using very sort of dangerous, but high amperage drains and very high amperage, uh, loading. So I was, I was pushing it quite fast. And the only way you can do that is if you monitor the batteries extremely carefully with temperatures. And I had a, I had a explosion proof room. Um, but th so, so this is kind of cool. AGM batteries are now reconditionable. Um, I had had a bunch of AGM batteries and uh, didn't have a lot of success reconditioning them before, but now I realized that I was trying to do it too quickly and I wasn't taking enough time. Um, but so I just wanted to share this with people who are interested in battery sulfation, uh, that it's totally possible. And the, and the circuit appears to be your high voltage source here, again, 14.4 volts intermittent with uh, a tied in cell to balance. So. You know, for the sake of argument, let's say you have a completely dead battery at uh, three, four, four, five volts, whatever it is. Could be seven, ten if you want, but uh, usually at ten volts, there's, there, it's easier to bring back. I'm, I'm saying sub ten, so that means you've lost a cell at least. And when you're down around seven and six and five, you've lost more than half the battery, um, way more than half. So anyway, because uh, a fully charged battery cooking coming off of a charger could be thirteen point eight, could be thirteen point one, but it's over thirteen, so you've lost way more than half the battery. Um, you tie your dead bat, your relatively dead battery into the source of the current. You tie a balancing load outside, and then you hit it with uh, current fairly regularly. And then the other key is you've got to be draining over time. So whenever this car sat, both of these batteries were being drained somewhat. Now the good thing is, is that one was being drained more than that one, but nonetheless, it was going through a it was going through an up and down cycle daily for a couple of weeks, and it broke the uh, the basic gel um, crystalline structure that had formed that had ruined the voltage on that. So I am thrilled, and I just wanted to share this with everybody. Hopefully, it was helpful. Um, these are these are some of the tricks that I, I have picked up from years of working with batteries, and also the uh, link below in the video um, will really get you started. It, it got me started. Uh, along with, you know, just experimenting on my own to get me started so that I could start saving a ton of money on batteries. And eventually I went into the battery business. I, you know, I think I told that story in one of my other videos, but, um, 
so that's the story on that, and uh, hopefully this has helped somebody out there save, oh, I don't know, 220 bucks times however many of those things you have. I know people that have uh, some boats are very popular uh, to use AGM batteries because you can flip them over and things like that, and they're not going to have a problem with it. Um, some RVs use them because they are no fumes. Uh, I know people who use them, AGM batteries, for uh, solar, solar power systems, and I think that is a 100% wrong application. Because if you go down one or two times below the recommended minimum and voltage with AGM, you are harming that battery significantly, and you'd have to do something along these lines. Now, before, they would say, well, you're just killing the battery, and that's it. You're done. Now, now that I've realized a, a circuit that will, will, will work uh, along these lines, um, that's not the case. But still, AGM batteries, I think, this is my opinion, AGM batteries for solar power systems, not the way to go. Flooded lead acid batteries are, are, are good. Old technology, you can get some more advanced ones. They're good. Um, the newest technology, the iron nickel systems, and then there's the lithium systems. I mean, you're getting into some very significant dollars, but nonetheless, there are better options than the AGM. I would not spend your money on an AGM battery at all. Um, just, you know, real problematic if you if you run into a situation where you overdrain your batteries, and that's quite likely to happen in a in a solar power system at some point. I mean, you know, it's not a regular practice thing. It's just once in a blue moon, like bad winter times or whatever. So in any case, that's all there is to it. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm always happy to, always happy to answer them. And uh, thanks for watching.